lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Good morning, everyone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for your goodness and the wonders of your salvation. For your grace, Lord God, and we know that you place us in this life, in this world, at this particular time in history for a reason. But we see prophecy being fulfilled. We see the signs of your son's coming. Let us understand the times in which we live, the seriousness of our calling. Above all, Lord God, let your name be glorified. Let us be a witness to the unsaved and empower your people to stand in these last days. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Oh, yeah. Shabbat shalom. We're going to study from the scriptures now. Turn with me, please, if you will, to the book of Zechariah the prophet, Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah. His name has the implication of the treasury of God. Zechariah, Zechariah 5. Let us understand certain things. From a literary perspective, from a literary perspective, the book of Revelation, which in Hebrew is called Chazon Yohanan, Apocalypsis in Greek, the book of Revelation is the most Hebraic book of the New Testament. It's the most Jewish. We have other books written to Jewish believers. Hebrews, obviously, the epistle of James. Epistles of Peter. Gospel of John, Gospel of Matthew, those things in the epistle of Jude were all written to believing Jews. That's not to say that the content does not apply to non-Jews. It does, doctrinally, theologically. But it means in order to understand what it means, for people of some other culture, we have to understand what it meant for the Jews of that time. Again, it's Sitzim Leben, it's cultural situation. So to a Jewish believer reading something like Philippians, well, it applies to them, but to understand how it applies to them, they have to understand it was written to Greeks at that time in history. Revelation, though, is different. Revelation follows Old Testament literary motifs. It follows Old Testament symbolism and literary motifs, even though it is in the New Testament canon. Although it is not a basis of doctrine, although it is not canonical, what you see in Revelation is a taking of Old Testament Hebrew apocalyptic literature like you find in Zechariah, Daniel, portions of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and so forth, and puts it into the Greek language. What's not canonical are first and second Enoch, apocryphal Enoch. But Enoch is biblically important literature because it shows you how the transition works from Greek apocalyptic to Hebrew. In other words, in the Old Testament, it would be Sheol, but in Revelation, it would be Hades. You take the Greek, the Hebrew concepts and put them into the Greek language. Every single chapter of the book of Revelation has a reference from the book of Ezekiel alone. Only one chapter does it. Bearing in mind there's no chapter divisions in the original text anyway. We have themes from the Torah. We have themes from certainly Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Daniel, all of these things come into play in the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the book of Revelation, New Testament apocalyptic, unless we understand Old Testament apocalyptic. 
Hence, the key to interpreting Revelation does not begin in Revelation. It begins in the Old Testament. So in approaching Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2, we begin in Zechariah. Zechariah was a post-exilic prophet. Judah and Benjamin went into the Babylonian captivity circa 585 B.C., as prophesied by Jeremiah, Isaiah, etc. At last 70 years, they come back. At least some people come back. Most did not. Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah are keen to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Most Jews did not even want to come back to Israel, and the ones who did were not too keen to rebuild the temple. When Ezra... Nehemiah get on with the work of rebuilding, reconstruction. They get opposed by the Horonite, by Sanballat, by the Samaritans. This shows you what's happening. Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah show you what's happening on earth. What Zechariah does is something different. He engages in apocalyptic. The Greek word apocalypsis means unveiling. He lifts up the curtain. When all this stuff is happening with Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah, Zechariah lifts up the curtain and shows you what's happening in the heavens at the same time. You understand? We struggle not against flesh and blood. What you see transpiring in time and space is a reflection of a spiritual conflict. We see this in the book of Daniel. We see it in the book of Revelation. But we certainly see it in Zechariah. Zechariah is apocalyptic. You see Zechariah, yeah. You see Zechariah standing before the throne, witnessing what's happening with Zerubbabel and Yeshua. Remember? And Satan accusing. So on back of what was happening, literally and historically, with Sanballat and the Horonite and all that stuff, that was simply a reflection of a spiritual battle in the heavenlies. In Revelation, Daniel is the same way. These struggles you see in the Middle East taking place even today. It is only a reflection of a battle in the heavenlies. This whole thing with Iran is Daniel chapter 10. It is a reflection of the spiritual struggle. Apocalyptic literature connects the events transpiring in time and space with events that are taking place in the heavenlies. Understand. Now, Satan had access to the throne. That is one reason there will be a new heaven and a new earth. In the new heaven, Satan will not have access to it. But he does have access to the present one until he will be cast down. At which point he will literally inhabit the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be a de facto incarnation of Satan. Another subject, I only mentioned it in passing. So in Zechariah, Zechariah is prophesying for three time periods, like all Israel's prophets once again. Zechariah is prophesying for his own time after the captivity. He's prophesying for the first coming of the Messiah. You see, the Messiah would come in riding on a donkey and things like this. And he's prophesying eschatologically for the return of the Messiah, chapters 12 through 14. He's prophesying for three different time periods, sometimes almost all in the same verse. It's not the same breath. Much of what he prophesies is Judeo-centric. It's specific for Israel and the Jews. Some of it also applies to the church and to other nations. Thus, when you go through a book like Zechariah, we're always asking, what is for his own time? What's for the first coming of Jesus? What's for the second coming of Jesus? What is specifically for Israel and the Jews? What is for the Jews that is also for the church and to other nations? You've got to work these things out as you work through the book. Very briefly in chapter 4, you see the two olive branches. These two olive branches obviously correspond to the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. We have much speculation. Is it Moses and Enoch, Moses and Elijah? In the Middle East, there are some Christians who believe one of those witnesses is the Apostle John. 
I have not heard that outside the Middle East, but in the Middle East, there are those who believe that. Well, there are many people in Scripture who prefigure... Sorry, we're recording. Can we turn the cell phones off, please? We're recording. There are many people in Scripture who prefigure the two witnesses, many. I'm not saying it's them, I'm saying it foreshadows them. You have to understand those who foreshadow the two witnesses to understand the two witnesses. The two angels who rescued Lot and his family from Sodom, they're pictures of the two witnesses. They teach something about the two witnesses. The Medaglion, the two spies who rescued, a, uh, who rescued Rahab and her family from Jericho, they're pictures of the two witnesses. The two olive branches in Revelation, Chapter 11 uh, are the two olive branches from Zechariah 4, corresponding to Zerubbabel, a descendant of the king, and Yeshua, not Jesus, the other Yeshua, a descendant of the high priest, who are being accused by Satan before the throne, the accused of the brethren. Now notice something about these two olive branches. If you look at the modern state of Israel, the national seal of the nation, the two olive branches are on it quite a thing. They have no ideas coming from the book of Revelation. Unsaved Jews have all the truth, but they don't understand it. <laughs> they have all the ingredients, but they still can't bake the cake because they don't believe in the Messiah. Well, let's look. We see before the lampstand in Zechariah 4, verse 2, I see a lampstand. A picture very much like Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. The seven spouts and so forth. And the two olive trees in verse 3. One on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left. The Rubabel and Yeshua. Now remember, Zechariah is showing you what's happening in heaven at the same time this stuff is happening on earth. Apocalyptic, he's lifting up the veil. That's the way apocalyptic works. It's like this. In the last days, it's a barometer of faithfulness. We are told in Daniel 12, none of the wicked will understand. Only the wise virgins will have oil in their lamp to see in the dark. And it's going to get very dark before Jesus comes. The illumination of the Holy Spirit will not be in their lamps. Thy word being a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The church of Laodicea was blind, didn't know it was blind. By sob to anoint your eyes. In the last days, understanding of Scripture becomes a gauge, a barometer, an indication of faithfulness. In other words, as we get closer to the return of Jesus, for the faithful church, the curtain's going to go up. For the apostate church, for the harlot church, for the ecumenical church, for the purpose-driven church, for the world council of churches, the veil's going to go down. They will understand less and less. The faithful church will understand more and more. You understand? It will get clearer and clearer to the faithful church. It'll get dimmer and dimmer to the unfaithful church. A time will come when they will realize they were wrong. But it'll be too late. The foolish virgins will be like the Song of Solomon. The whole wise and foolish virgins come straight from the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon, the Shir Shadim, was what was being read in the synagogue that very Shabbos, the next Shabbos, when Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse. That's what was being read. The Song of Solomon is based around two dreams. In chapter 3, Shulamit is ready for the bridegroom to come. It's her best dream. In chapter 5, she isn't. He comes and goes and she misses him. It's her worst nightmare. What Jesus did was he took what was being read in the synagogues. And in the temple, to this day, it's read in the synagogue. And that's Shabbos of um, Hag Matzot. And he applied it to himself messianically. When he comes, it's going to be the best dream or the worst nightmare. Chapter 3 of Song of Solomon, best dream. Chapter 5, her worst nightmare. It's the wise and foolish virgins. 
the unfaithful church are not going to understand until it's too late. Now just look at it. Again, churches, denominations that a generation ago had a strong scriptural tradition. Again, Baptist brethren, Mennonites, early Pentecostals, they were all biblically, biblically focused. Today, the depth of understanding of scripture and biblical exposition is getting more and more shallow. More and more Bible colleges and seminaries are teaching programmatics instead of doctrinal theology. It's getting shallower and shallower. There's less and less understanding of the Word of God, less and less emphasis on it, more and more motivational speaking, less and less exposition. The curtain is coming down. For the faithful church, the curtain will go up. Unfortunately, the faithful church will be in the minority. Well, let's understand this further. We've got these two witnesses now, right? Prefigured by the two olive branches corresponding to Zechariah and Yeshua. Everybody got that? What do they teach about the two witnesses in Revelation? Remember, he's a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah. Look at Ezra chapter 4. Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's household and said to them, let us build with you, for we like you seek your God. We've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esar Hadon, king of Assyria, metaphor for the devil, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua, you see that? And the rest of the heads of the father's household of Israel said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. The two witnesses will resist the ecumenical interfaith agenda. Let us build together, we have to unite. Again, Rick Warren's global peace plan. We have to unite with Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons to bring in global peace, the ecumenical movement. Peter Kreef, ecumenical jihad. We have to have union with Islam to morally redeem society. We have the same God. Let's build together. You have nothing in common with us. Antichrist will build Babylon the Great as his footstool. He will unite the world's false religious systems in confederation with its corrupt economic and political system. Let us unite. He'll have this agenda, but the whole thing is predicated on a political agenda. If you look at what's happening in Europe now, just picture a map of Europe. What Daniel says will happen. A reconfederation of the countries in the Roman Empire. Well, let's take Ireland. Ireland is a Celtic country. Let's take Poland. Poland is a Slavic country. Let's take Portugal. Portugal is a Latin country. And let's take uh, Austria. Austria is a Germanic country. You've got a Germanic country, a Celtic country, a Slavic country. Right? One Slavic, one Germanic, one Latin, one Celtic. What's the only thing they have in common? Cuisine? No. Culture? No. Music? No. History? No. Language? No. What's the only thing they have in common? Nomine Patri cum Filio cum Spiritu Santo. You understand? You get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama, but the two witnesses are going to resist this. This seduction has come into evangelicism because of people like Rick Warren and his supporters like John Piper and Mark Driscoll. They're making this stuff mainstream. It's all the working of Satan. And most Christians are too biblically ignorant and too naive and too undiscerning to even understand it. Now again, when the curtain was still up, and you said, 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, we should unite with people who worship other gods to bring in worldwide peace. Most evangelicals would say that's crazy. Today they're just following men of Satan like Rick Warren. He's a man of Satan. That man is, a, he's on the devil's payroll. We have to unite with worshipers of other gods to bring in global peace. He's setting the stage for Antichrist. He works for the devil. And John Piper works for him. They're buying the whole bill of goods, but the two witnesses are going to be at the forefront of opposing this. Now look when they're going to oppose it. When the temple is under reconstruction. In Revelation 11, you see the tribulational temple. Now that tells us something about Revelation 11, doesn't it? There's going to be a move to rebuild the temple. And there's going to be an effort to unite Christians with false religions under the guise of unity. That's what's going to happen in Revelation 11. But it's only going to replay what happened in Zechariah, as they understand. After prayer, the first key to understanding prophecy is history. If you don't know what did happen, you're never going to know what's going to happen. You understand? There is nothing in the book of Revelation that's not in the Old Testament somewhere. Let's move down to chapter 5 now of Zechariah. Zechariah 5.5 5. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. And again, he said, this is the appearance in all the land. And behold, the lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there two women were coming out with the wind in their wings. And they had the wings like the wings of a stork. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and heavens. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where were they taking the ephah? And he said to me to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. Let us understand we have four elements that come into play in the book of Revelation, we must understand all four. Shinar. We must understand what is Shinar. Second, we must understand the identity of The wicked woman. Thirdly, we must understand why an ephah. Fourthly, we must understand the stork. The stork. Shinar in Hebrew means tooth of a city. Tooth of a city. Two words, shin, ar. The Hebrew letter shin looks like teeth, doesn't it? It's the SH sound. Surely, should. Shall. Shin. Looks like he. Babylon was located in Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent. Today it's called the Sha'at al Arab in Iraq. Go like that. It is the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates. It's not just the city. Babylon was the name of the city and the empire that bore its name. 
but it was the region, the location. Like you might say New York. Well, there's New York City and there's New York State. The Jews did not live only or mainly in the city. They lived in the region surrounding it. They lived in the Fertile Crescent. That's what it looks like. So we need to understand this. Turn with me to Daniel 1, please. Verses 1 and 2, in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a type of the Antichrist, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Notice treasury. Zechariah's name. The treasures of God had been taken to Babylon, and there was a quest to restore them to Jerusalem. The names of the Hebrew prophets indicate something about their mission, their character, their calling. Shinar, tooth of the city. It's not just Babylon as a city. And it's not Babylon as an empire. It's greater Babylon as a metropolitan area. Huh? Vancouver and its suburbs. If you said to somebody in Toronto or Montreal, Abbotsford, they would just think of Abbotsford as an outer suburb of Vancouver. In other words, it's Babylon, but not specifically the city. Includes the city. This is the Babylon motif. I live in England near London. In the days of Sherlock Holmes or Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police was located on an alleyway between two buildings called Scotland Yard. Just an alleyway between two buildings running from the Thames embankment to Whitehall at Scotland Yard. Now, the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police is about a half mile away on Victoria Street in a rather large modern building next to the home office. But it's still called Scotland Yard, even though it's not located there anymore. In my native New York, the original Broadway theaters were located on Broadway. Today, they're on the side streets off of Broadway, but you still call the theater industry in New York Broadway. The original entrance to the New York Stock Exchange was on Wall Street. Today, it is on Broad Street, but they still refer to it as Wall Street. The name of the original location becomes a metaphor for the institution. Not irrespective of geography, but not limited by it. Hence, in his epistle, Peter writes, at the end of his first epistle, she who was in Babylon greets you, doesn't he? He was writing from Rome, most certainly. The mystery religions of ancient Babylon migrated westward. We know this for sure. When in fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah 44 and 45, Okay, the Persians conquered Cyrus, conquered Babylon. The priests of Babylon, there were 300 of them, migrated, taking the mystery religions of Babylon with them, westward to Pergamum. Jesus writes of Pergamum, where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells, referring to the altar of Zeus, but the whole thing came from Babylon. All false religion came from Babylon in the days of Semiramis and Nimrod. It all goes back to the Tower of Babel. It has its Old Testament apex in the Babylonian Empire, but by the New Testament, it's Rome. 
Before he lost his marbles, Luther wrote of Roman Catholicism, he wrote a treatise called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. But all these things go to Babylon. Freemasonry, all this stuff comes from Babylon originally. It just culturally morphs and mutates, but that's the source of it. Well, let's understand this. All of the Babylons in scripture and in Jewish and church history, all of them. The Romans destroyed the second temple to Shabaab the same day as the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, same day of the year. It's all Babylon. Even the rabbis understood this in part. All of these Babylons prefigure, foreshadow Babylon the Great. You understand? Going way back to the Tower of Babel, they are all shadows of Babylon the Great. In other words, to understand the nature and identity of Babylon the Great, you have to go back to the Tower of Babel and trace each Babylon. They all give some indication of the final one. Again, the Kingdom of Antichrist. That's the Babylon motif. Identified with the wicked woman. Second thing we must identify is the woman called wickedness. What scripture does is it uses sexual seduction to illustrate the nature of spiritual seduction. The wicked woman. There are a number of them. As we'll see, Delilah was one. As we'll see, Queen at, well, Queen at Leah was another. But above all, it was Jezebel, the wicked woman, who seduces. Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 2. Verse 20, he tells the church of Thyatira, continual sacrifice in Greek. We looked at this yesterday. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so they commit acts of immorality and eat things, sacrifice to idols, as we looked at the transubstantiation, etc. She seduces. Why does Jesus use Jezebel to illustrate the spiritual seduction of the church? Remember Elijah, those who eat at Jezebel's table? A pagan Phoenician queen, worshiper of Baal, Baal, a counterfeit of Christ, rose from the dead every spring. They had a resurrection narrative. The Madonna, the whole bit, associated with his mother. But again, that all goes back to Babylon, to Tammuz, Semiramis. In any event, she marries Ahab and seduces the whole nation by political means. She gets her religion into the woodwork of the nation by political means means, or under political auspices, through her union with Ahab, the whole nation gets seduced into idolatry in the days of Elijah. She covets Naboth's vineyard. This brings her into conflict with Eliyahu Hanavi Elijah, right? Pay attention. You won't get this stuff from commentaries. This is how the early church interpreted the scripture. Elijah, Elisha, and Yohanan Hamatbil, John the Baptist, all have the same spirit. You understand? Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit. With Elijah, the wicked woman turned the king and the political establishment against the people of God, resulting in a conflict with Elijah, right? What happened with John the Baptist? The wicked woman... Herodias, turn the king, son of Herod, against the people of God, resulting in a conflict with Elijah. What is going to happen in the book of Revelation? The ministry of Elijah comes back in some way, according to Jesus and according to Malachi. But it's going to be like that. You're going to see the religious system, in league with the political system, turning against the people of God both the faithful believers and ultimately Israel. And the ministry of Elijah will come into play at this point. You understand what I'm saying? 
A is to B as B is to C. Know the history, then you can know the prophecy. Don't try the calculus till you can do the algebra. Don't do the algebra till you know how to count. Wicked woman. Spiritual seduction. There's good girls and bad girls. Good girls are pictures of the bride of Christ. Bad girls are pictures of spiritual seduction. How does this work? In Proverbs, in Hebrew, Proverbs are called the book of Mishle, the book of Mashavs. You have a Mashal. And the nimshal. An example of something from everyday life or nature or whatever is the mashal. Its spiritual interpretation or meaning is the nimshal. Every proverb is dualistic. There's two levels. Like a gold ring to a swine's nose, mashal is a beautiful woman without discretion, nimshal. Like apples of gold and settings of silver, mashal, is a prudent word fitly spoken, nimshal. You understand how Proverbs work? Find the mashal, find the nimshal. Turn with me to Proverbs 5. The most common metaphor for the great tribulation and the events leading up to it is the figure of the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work. The bridegroom comes for the bride in the Song of Solomon in the night. The bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. In Matthew 25, he's coming like a thief in the night. Have you noticed it's getting dark out there? Did you watch the news this morning? The night. Let's look, Proverbs 5. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ears to my understanding that you may observe discretion that your lips may reserve knowledge for the lips of an adulteress. Drip honey, smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of she old. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She doesn't even know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go to the door of her house. Look at verse 9. Lest you give your vigor to the others and your years to the cruel one. Now, who did that? Samson. Gave his vigor, strength to the wicked woman. The idea of an adulteress, it's borrowed from the books like Proverbs, Amos, and especially Hosea, and also Jeremiah by James in his epistle. He calls worldly churches adulteresses. It's the concept of znut, harlotry. Israel was to be God's woman much the same as the church is the bride of Christ. When Israel went after other gods, God calls the idolatry adultery, doesn't he? Daughter of Zion, you played the harlot. Keep away from the adulteress. Mashal. Who's a marvel woman? Her lips drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech. The wicked woman, this spirit of false religion, knows how to talk. She knows how to seduce. She can sweet talk. Shemin is oil, anointing of the spirit, 
these people are smoother than the anointing. They have a counterfeit anointing, but it's manifested by a seductive, smoothly presented speech. God loves you and he wants to bless you. Yes, friends. He wants you to take a step of faith. Now just forget about your circumstances and take your checkbook out. <laughs> Smoother than oil is her speech. Now if they were taking the checkbook out to write a check for missions or evangelism, <laughs> I'm not saying the ends would justify the means, but I could cope with it. I could deal with it. But when these guys are simply prostituting the word of God for their own aggrandizement, <laughs> it's something else. Spiritual seduction always sweet talks. It's religious speech. It manipulates naive, undiscerning people. They get taken in by the presentation. They get conned by the Joyce Myers of this world. In the end, she's bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Every cult, every false religion in the world has a two-edged sword. And they're sharp. To the Muslims, they have a Koran. To Orthodox Jews, they have a Talmud. Tibetan Buddhists have the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Hindus have a Bhagavad Gita. Muslims, again, have a Koran. Catholics have a papal encyclical. Mormons have the Book of Mormon. They all have a sharp, two-edged sword. False religion always has a two-edged sword that counterfeits scripture. Thus, we need something living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. You understand? False religion has a weapon, and they know how to use it. Keep away from her house. Marshall is, is telling a drunken sailor to keep away from a bordello. Of course it is. Marshall. Nimshall? <laughs> Don't go near Mark Driscoll's church. Don't go near Saddlebrook. Don't go near Willow Creek. Keep away from that whorehouse. I remember my church in New York when I was the young believer had a rescue mission getting prostitutes away from pimps. It was always the same story. There were girls from abusive family backgrounds who came to the big city, Manhattan, and they were often abused or sexually abused even by their own fathers. So they were vulnerable. These pimps would know how to pick them out, and they became this male paternal figure who gives them attention and buys them presents and becomes what they never had and prey on them. Then they get them high on drugs. Then they get them strung out on drugs. Then they put them on the street. And when they burn out after two, three, four years, they go out and get some more. They're just pimps. Now understand, these pimps were just predators. You'd always see them with the big pink Cadillacs and designer suits and wads of money. They never would have had those cars, those clothes, or that money if they were in a legitimate business or profession. They couldn't make that kind of money as a high-powered lawyer or on Wall Street or as an oral surgeon or anything. They're not smart enough. They're just predatory. If they weren't pimps, they wouldn't have that money. Hella evangelists are the same way. They're theologically ignorant. They're not very accomplished intellectually, most of them. But they're predatory. All they are are religious pimps who prostitute the word of God. And the stupid churches that follow them are their whores. That's all. It's all spiritual seduction. Look at chapter 6, Proverbs. 
Verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Keep away from him. Verse 24, keep away from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not go and desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her catch you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread. Whoa. Understand how prostitutes work. Look at chapter 7. Verse 4, say to wisdom, you're my sister, call to understanding my intimate friend, that they may keep you from that adulteress, literally a strange woman, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. At the window of my house, I looked through the lattice, and I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner. He takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, in the darkness. You understand? Spiritual seduction increases in the last days. Behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot. Prostitutes go to work at night. Cunning of heart. She's boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She's now on the streets, now in the squares, lurks by every corner. She seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I paid my vows. Therefore I've come out to meet you to seek your presence earnestly. I found you. I've spread my couch with coverings with the linens of Egypt. Figure of the world. I've spread my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. John 19.39. Anointed for burial. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. The man is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He's not at home. He's gone on a long journey. Don't worry about him coming back. Don't worry about Jesus coming back, says the seductress. She pretends to like him. He flatters with her eyes. I've witnessed to many prostitutes. I've known prostitutes that become Christians. Prostitutes don't like their clients. It's only money. Slam, bam, thank you, man. Then they go out and find another one. Prostitutes don't like their prospective clients. They don't even like themselves. It's all a con. But when it gets dark, they hit the streets. It's getting dark out there. Spiritual seduction increases in the last days, Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse. The man is not at home. Don't worry about him coming back, says Rick Warren. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. That deceiver teaches that. Mark Driscoll mocks people who study end time prophecy. He stereotypes them all as conspiracy theorists obsessed with the Illuminati. Daryl Coates in England says the rapture is a fantasy and a myth. Rick Joyner says the rapture is of the devil. Mike Bickle says the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. The man's not at home. Don't worry about it. Keep away from prophecy. But wait a minute, Mr. Warren. Jesus said be alert. Watch out for these things. Be alert. That was his command. Oh, who cares what Jesus Christ said? We don't need Jesus Christ. We have Rick Warren. Who needs the New Testament? We have the purpose-driven lie. Rick Warren says avoid end-time prophecy. It's a very, you cannot believe Rick Warren and Jesus Christ. One of them, one of them is a satanic liar. One of them is a satanically inspired liar. Either Jesus Christ is a satanically inspired liar or Rick Warren is. The wicked woman. Spiritual seduction.
Turn with me to Revelation chapter 17, please. Let's look at it. Verse 4, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. Verse 5, upon her forehead a name was written. Verse 6, I saw the woman. Verse 7, I'll tell you the mystery of the woman. Verse 9, the seven heads upon which the woman sits. The woman, the woman, the woman. Verse 18, the woman whom you saw. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the Greek canon. Having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, straight out of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. And it goes on. Come out of her, my people. In Greek, a haunt of unkosher birds. <laughs> What's this thing with the birds? This woman, why is she associated with these birds? The same reason she's associated with the birds in Zechariah. What are these birds, these hateful and unclean birds? Once again, turn with me, as we looked at yesterday morning, Leviticus chapter 11. We studied Kashrut and famine yesterday. What are these birds? We'll commence in verse 13, please. Turn to Leviticus 11. These, moreover, you shall detest among the birds. They are abhorrent, not to be eaten, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, the falcon, and its kind, every raven and its kind, the ostrich, the owl, the seagull, the hawk, and its kind, the little owl and the koromot, the great owl, the white owl and the pelican, the carrion vulture, and the stork. Keep reading. The heron and its kinds, the hoopoe and the bats. Now the raven said Elijah, even God can use these things for his purposes. But it's unclean, it's unkosher. They shall be detestable to you. Let us understand that these are the birds indigenous to the ancient Near East. There's other species like an albatross, only indigenous to the Pacific. It's only talking about birds found in the ancient Near East. According to its kind, the fihamin. The word mean, kind, is where we translate it into Greek genus. That's where you get the Hebrew word for sex, according to its kind. But the last species name there is a bat. It's not according to the kind. A bat is not phylogenetically related to a bird in any direct sense. Essentially, it is a rodent, an airborne rodent. It's not according to the kind. You shall look upon these unclean birds the way you'd look upon a bat. You understand? A rat with wings. It seems to resemble the way a bird behaves, but... Notice the three characteristics of these unclean birds. The birds that were kosher, the birds the Hebrews could eat, only perched in trees. They nested terrestrially, either on the ground or on a ledge, a cliff face, or on a roof or even a windowsill. They nested terrestrially. Unclean birds nested in trees. What's it say in Ephesians? We struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of the air. Hateful and unclean birds. Second, 
The kosher birds were herbivorous. Unkosher birds are carnivorous. They devoured flesh. Like in Ezekiel, the birds, a picture of the demonic invasion. Third, they ate carrion. They feasted on the dead. The Zoroastrian religion practices neither burial or cremation. They dismember corpses, and they leave the fragments of the dismembered corpses on a cliff for the vultures to come, take it away piece by piece, thinking it's going to heaven. Well, let's begin with these birds. Pictures of demons? Of course they are. Ephesians 6. What did Jesus say? Where the body is, the vultures will gather. Remember? Remember when they had the suzerainty sacrifice, bisected carcass when Abraham made the covenant with God and the flame of Yahweh, the Shalheb of Yah went through? Abraham had to chase the vultures. The ostrich. I once witnessed to a rabbi in New York from Daniel 9. Hamashiach keeps the deck of over the boot, Nifne, Hahorban, to the Betamitash, Hashinit. The Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. He said, Give me a better source than Daniel. I said, you just told me Daniel was a Hebrew prophet. He spoke the word of God. You want a better source than God? If it was a better source than God, it wouldn't be God, Rabbi. Deal with the text. Even the Talmud says it's about the Messiah. Sanhedrin 97b. Can you please explain this, Rabbi? He hit his head. Talk to a Muslim. It says in the Hadith that Muhammad married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, when she was six, took her virginity when she was nine. Can you please tell me how you can believe a pedophile is a greater prophet than Jesus? Allahu Akbar! Well, it says in the book of Doctrines and Covenants that Brigham Young said there was Quakers who lived on the moon. Got to be a thousand years old and Joseph Smith said there was Quakers living on the sun. I got a burning in my bosom and I'll testify to you the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. That's supposed to solve everything. It says in Timothy, forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons. It's no wonder your priests are molesting kids all the time. Doesn't that what it says, Monsignor? It's a doctrine of demons. He made them male and female and said it was good. You're calling something bad God said was good. You outlaw what's natural. People will do something perverted and unnatural. It's a doctrine of demons, mandatory celibacy. What does an ostrich do? It hides from reality, doesn't it? You can show what Jehovah's Witness 25,000 times when they knock on the door that Jesus is worshipped as God. You can show them 25,000 times. That's the ostrich spirit. They are demonically deceived. You understand? People who hide from reality. Unable to refute the irrefutable. Unable to defend the indefensible. They hide from reality. It's a demonic deception. It's the ostrich. There's always a reason for these things. The largest species of bird in the ancient Middle East, however, where we get the 
myth of the stork bringing the baby was the stork. The most powerful orthomusculature with the longest wingspan, the biggest beak, could carry the greatest payload, the furthest is the stork. A big, powerful demon. Some demons are stronger than others, aren't they? Remember Jesus said this kind only goes out with prayer and fasting? It's like some birds are stronger than others. But you're dealing with a stork? False religion is empowered by the stork. Powers of the air. Then we have the ephah. If you're coming with us to Israel in September, we will show you Bedouins. You'll still see Bedouin women carrying an ephah. It's a food container, largely for grain, but it's an ambiguous term. It's not only the basket for carrying the grain or the food, but it's a unit of measure, like a basket full, an ephah, an ephah, you understand? It's a unit of measure as well as the container itself, like a cup of sugar. <laughs> ephah is about the size of this table. And a woman could easily sit in it. She hides in it with a lead cover. Why lead? Lead is not a holy metal. Holy metals in scripture were the ones used in the construction of the tabernacle of the ark, like Nehoshet, brass, kesef, silver, zahav, gold, but not lead. Lead was very heavy, but it was a common metal, not a holy one. But you could hide under it. But it's heavy, so to transport it, you need the wings of a stork. You carry the big payload of far distance. In other words, friends, where is the wicked woman? How does she get in? She hides. Where does she hide? In the food supply. Pay attention. What does Paul say to Timothy? Speak the things fitting for sound doctrine because the bimbo is always hiding in the basket. The bimbo is in the basket. She gets into the food. How does the church get seduced? False doctrine. Why do people read Purpose Driven and the God Chases and all this kind of shock? Because the bimbo is in the basket. Do you realize there's churches, Bible study groups, home groups, thousands and thousands of them all over the world, instead of studying the Word of God, they're reading the shack? Written by a man who says Jesus didn't die for sin, William B. Young, written by a non-Christian who denies the gospel? And that's what they're studying? The bimbo is in the basket. Empowered by the wings of a stork. Where is she going? Babylon. We'll be concluding shortly, but let's understand this a little more clearer. Turn with me to the parables of the king, the Matthew 13, please. Similar to Proverbs, the parables of the kingdom have to be interpreted in light of each other, not in isolation. In other words, if a word or a figure or a term means something in one parable of the kingdom, it essentially has the same meaning in the other parables of the kingdom. You understand? Let's look at chapter 13. 
Verse 4, and he sowed some seeds, they fell next to the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Right? Now let's look when he interprets the parable. Okay? Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes, the devil, and snatches away. That word is harpezo, literally raptures. The devil raptures away what has been sown in his heart. We have a tape called the Great Church Robbery. We explain this. This is the one on whom the seed was sown next to the road. So the birds are identified as demons, aren't they? Now understand the folly of some people today, some preachers. Look at verses 31, 32, and 33. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. It's smaller than all the seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. I've heard of preachers saying things like, if we just have faith like a mustard seed, the church is going to grow and people are going to come and join. That's what they think it means. These are unclean and hateful birds that nest in branches. Clean birds only perch in branches. It's a haunt of demons. It's a demonic attack. The birds are evil. But here comes the bimbo. He spoke another parable in verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. A little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough. What did Jesus say? What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 5? Clean out the leaven. Get rid of it. it contributes nothing to the nutritional value of bread. It only puffs up. Satan's first sin was pride. Man's first sin was pride. Isaiah 14, Genesis 3. Pride is the seminal sin that begets other sin. But it's particularly associated with false doctrine. Hence, Jesus warns, beware of the leaven. The bimbo puts the leaven in the cakes. There's three of them. My friend Arnold Fruchtenbaum once said something. I found it very interesting. The three main expressions of Christendom historically have been the Latin church, Roman Catholicism, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and Protestantism. And there's leaven in all three of them. The bimbo is in the basket. That's how she gets in. So we put it all together. The wicked woman. Gets into the food. Demonically empowered, goes to Babylon. Babylon the Great. Where is the ecumenical movement leading? Shinar. Where is that woman who seduces God's people taking them? Shinar. How is she doing it? Demonic power. What is her vehicle for such an achievement, diabolical as it is? The food. She's going to Babylon. The ecumenical movement leads to Babylon. The World Council of Churches leads to Babylon. The purpose driven lie leads to Babylon. It's all going to Babylon. The bimbo is in the basket. She's going to Babylon. Now I'll tell you the good news. Now I'll tell you the positive, encouraging aspect. Now I'll tell you the other factor in the equation. Yes, the bimbo's in the basket. 
Yes, she's demonically empowered, and yes, she's going to Babylon the Great. That's the bad news. The good news is, by the grace of Jesus, we don't have to go with that. God bless.